Work, as we have seen, is a crucial part of a God-centered existence. Obviously, we can only work to the Lord to the capacity that we are able, that God provides, but work is intended to be a key part of a God-centered existence. Work matters to the Lord. It matters tremendously. Men, most people spend most of their life working. It's strange that we spend so little theological attention and time on the practice and calling that most people spend most of their life doing. C.S. Lewis said it well. Most men must glorify God by doing to His glory something which is not per se an act of glorifying, but which becomes so by being offered. If, as I now hope, cultural activities are innocent and even useful, then they also, like the sweeping of the room in George Herbert, Herbert's poem, can be done to the Lord. The work of a charwoman and the work of a poet become spiritual in the same way and on the same condition. Luther, several centuries prior, said much the same thing, in fact, shaped the thinking of Protestant churches. Even seemingly secular works, Luther said, are a worship of God and an obedience well-pleasing to God. This is true, according to Luther, even of daily household tasks, which have no appearance of sanctity, and yet these very works in connection with the household are more desirable than all the works of the monks and nuns of the Catholic Church, be they ever so laborious and impressive. I love that. I love Luther's vocation, his understanding of work. Even daily household tasks are far more important and desirable, according to him, than all the priestly work of the Catholic Church. Secular works, or seemingly secular works, are a worship of God and an obedience that is well-pleasing to God. One of the reasons I love the Reformation and I love the theology of the, Re of the Reformers is that they recovered a strong biblical and theological conception of work and vocation. They understood, to use their term, that work is to be done quorum Deo, that all of life is to be lived quorum Deo, unto God. That's what that Latin phrase means. Every moment of life is a, is a moment lived quorum Deo. There are no moments that are outside the context of quorum Deo living. And that altogether reframes the way many of us think about our work. I would encourage us to bring this to bear on a doctrine of biblical womanhood and make sure that we teach that the duties of a godly woman that she performs that are anonymous, plain, and ordinary are meaningful duties seen by God that will be rewarded by God that are to be done quorum Deo in a spirit of joyful service of the Lord just as any calling of the Christian falls in this same line of thought. I say this in application to womanhood, though, because according to feminism, household work is meaningless work, where the Bible gives us the complete opposite perspective on household work and on anonymous tasks, things that the world would call duty and drudgery. All these truths, all these doctrines, or parts of the doctrine of work, free us. True freedom involves drawing out the full measure of our unique gifting. And this is another part of a theology of vocation. We have not all been called to the ta same task. We are not all given the same gifts and abilities and attributes. We all are a unique person. We have our own unique skills, abilities, and proclivities. And part of a biblical 
understanding of vocation is that we want to help people find what they can do for the glory of God that uniquely employs and calls out their talents and abilities. And we're not, as members of Christ's church, supposed to look over at other members of the body and think, well, that person is an ear and I'm only an eye. Well, that person is a, an elbow and I'm only a pinky joint or something like this. According to the Apostle Paul, we're supposed to understand that other people have their gifting and proclivity from the Lord, and we have ours. And that is a huge part of how you will find contentment in this world. For a lot of us, it is not going to be uh, by having this, again, stratospherically exciting career that everybody is awed by. For a lot of us, a great deal of joy is going to come as God allows and blesses, from finding what we are uniquely gifted to do and then hopefully plying that trade as long as we can, as hard as we can. That's a huge part of Christian vocation, recognizing the uniqueness of the individual and specifically the gifting of God in every person for His glory. What are you good at? What are the people you minister to gifted in? Uh, In in a sense, a pastor is kind of a a director. (laughs) Understand this in the right way. But part of what he helps the sheep of his flock do is find how they uniquely can serve God. And when they find something they are good at, they do that as we talked about from Colossians 3, 23 to 24, not for man, but for the Lord. Don't misunderstand me. We will not necessarily be in the calling or job or profession that we we fully delight in at all times. But we do pray for that. We do want to discover what we are really good at, what God has made us to do. And then we do want to push that way as much as we can. That's not ungodly. That's not unrighteous. I actually think that that is righteousness applied. Recognizing, oh, wait. I don't have these skills. I don't have these abilities. I have these. This is where I should go. I might have thought for many years even, I might have been told, I I should be this. It turns out that's not where I'm gifted. I'm gifted over here. This is what God made me to do. This is where I really flourish and thrive. I think I should press into this. Again, discovering what we love most or are best at will not necessarily guarantee that we get to do that in a full-time job, but we do, as much as we can, want to match up our interests and our gifting with our day-to-day work. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And pastors can provide shepherding and direction as they discern in their people where they are qualified and gifted and then direct those people as much as is possible in that direction. We have to bring to bear our doctrine of divine sovereignty on all of this, on all of this discussion of vocation. We have to factor in what I was talking about earlier in this class, that for many of us, there are going to be a good number of tasks or duties on a daily basis that don't charge our heart right up to 100%, and yet we also need to factor in that God has made us an individual and we shouldn't be scared of a right biblical understanding of individualism. In fact, we should embrace it and we should know that our calling, as best we can discern it, is a calling from God. We have talked already about, for example, the craftsman who built the temple. We talked about Bezalel yesterday. I, I was just upstairs getting my, uh, my machine-based coffee okay, that I've been getting on my breaks up there in the faculty and staff break room. And I'm very thankful for this machine-based coffee with its strong dosage of milk. I was walking by the faculty offices, nice faculty offices up there, by the way. Faculty from schools are always eyeing other faculty members' offices at other schools. You're always assessing this. It's just a thing you do. How big are they? How, how much window coverage do you get? How many bookshelves? Do they have room for a little table? Is the table high top? Is it low top? Do they have pictures from their kids on the walls? What what do they have on their walls? They have degrees. 
et cetera, and so on. Faculty members, you got to, pastors do it too, right? Pastors check out, they, it's like a dog. You sniff out the other pastor's office. What does he have in here? How has he set this? Oh, he's got built-ins. Well, are those real built-ins, or did he buy those from Ikea? Uh, those are Ikea built-ins. Those aren't like, you know, fine cherry wood built-ins. Well, yeah, so we, we, I don't need to feel bad about this office, my office. My office ranks pretty well according to this one. You know, we, we all do this. We all do this, okay? And, and there's a dispensation of grace for that, okay? You can, you can feel free to evaluate other pastoral or ministerial offices with some freedom, okay? Anyway, I was looking at the, the MacArthur Center for Preaching office, and I, I was told I should peek in. I peeked in to the office, and there's a guy cutting wood uh, midstream, so that was interesting. Sorry about that. I'd like to offer a public apology to him. But anyway, I, I, I just, I had to admire this beautiful design, this beautiful wood design. And I was thinking, in this minute, 10 minutes ago, it's like the craftsmen. Craftsmen really do matter in the kingdom of God. They, they build beautiful things. Francis Schaeffer has said in his tiny little pamphlet, very impactful, Art and the Bible. Everybody go read Art and the Bible. It'll take you an afternoon. It'll take you a couple hours. It's really good. He says this on the artistry of... of uh, of craftsmanship. In verses 16 and 17 of 2 Chronicles 3, we read, and he made chains in the oracle and put them on the tops of the pillars, and he made a hundred pomegranates and put them on the chains. And he set up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So Schaefer comments, here are two freestanding columns in the temple. They supported no ar architectural weight and had no utilitarian engineering significance. They were there only because God said they should be there as a thing of beauty. Upon the capitals of those columns were pomegranates fastened upon chains, artwork upon artwork. If we understand what we are reading here, it simply takes our breath away. This, Schaefer says, is something overwhelmingly beautiful. I love that. I love that. I love aesthetics. Uh, I wrote a short book uh, with Doug Sweeney called uh, Jonathan Edwards on Beauty. I think that's the most work in print I've done on aesthetics or on beauty. But um, in, in writing that little book, I was thinking at some level, I'm sure, of these sorts of insights. Schaefer helped me understand from this little pamphlet, really, it's, it's a booklet, uh, Art and the Bible, uh, that he wrote in 1973, it's been republished uh, by InterVarsity 2009, that there were details in the temple that were not utilitarian and functional, which is very different from the way that a lot of modern evangelicals think about architecture and building and uh, where the church meets. And there's a lively conversation to have about this. I'm not <clears throat> standing here before you to say that every local church should have some kind of European cathedral in order to worship the Lord. And yet just note that even in the Old Testament temple, there are details that are not functional. Upon the capitals of those columns, Schaefer points out, were pomegranates fastened upon chains. Stone pomegranates, the Old Testament temple. So what's the point? The point is twofold. The point is that we have a strong category, I think, as Christians for beauty, not just divine beauty, yes, but flowing out of divine beauty, beauty in the world God has made, beauty even in our physical spaces, to whatever degree that can take place. And then secondly, that we will only have works of beauty if we develop people who find their unique calling, gifting, and ability to develop beauty in the world that God has made. I think we really should, in teaching a doctrine of vocation and work, teach people to be craftsmen, to understand themselves as those who, who, are, who are crafting something valuable before God. Craftsmanship. I would closely associate vocation with craftsmanship, not just when you build a physical structure, you see it there, but I would, I would encourage you to teach Christian mothers, that they are craft women. They are, they are crafting, as God allows, a, a little eternal soul to know God. They're not, they're not just doing duties. It's right to do your duty. You've got to bring that mentality to your work. But also, do those duties under the, the broader heading of craftsmanship, that you're building something beautiful to the Lord in your day-to-day -day vocation. And that matters even in jobs where it may not feel like you are doing something beautiful. You're working at Home Depot. 
and you know, you're, you're stacking shelves or something like this, and you think, well, I don't have some soaring heart attitude when I'm refilling drill bits on the shelf or something. But again, if you understand that you are crafting a vocation, you are inhabiting a calling as a Christian, that glorifies God, that is doxological in all parts of it, N not just the time at your work when you bow your head and pray to God, but all parts of it can be done for the Lord. The, the worker, I will submit this to you, the worker who approaches their work, their daily labor from a posture of craftsmanship is going to be a different worker than the one who thinks they are just punching a clock, getting benefits, and drawing a wage. We glorify God and we want the sheep in the, in the churches we pastor to hear that we glorify God when we start businesses and we grow them to produce much value for many people, creating jobs and wealth and value where none previously existed. That is a serious way that Christian men and women can honor God by starting businesses, especially men in providing for their family and produce value, and it's very, very challenging in this season right now, walking in the streets of Glendale, where I've been staying this week and seeing one business after another either closed, boarded up, or just absent. Um, so, so that's challenging, and we should expect that if our culture secularizes, that we will see business and vocation targeted as a negative reality. We glorify God when we train for years in a specific field to acquire more and more skill that may not have a mass market effect, but serves us well in a profession. I believe God's glory is bound up in that. We glorify God when we teach and love children, doing all we can to build into them. That, too, is vocational work. Raising children is vocational. It's not just passing the time. It's not instrumental or functional. It's, it's doxological, by which I mean God-glorifying work. All of it matters. All of it shapes a child's heart. All of it shapes their existence. All of that is meaningful to God. We glorify God when we serve in menial jobs that others may despise and our co-workers may groan about, but that we approach from a God-centered theistic perspective. God's glory is bound up there. God's glory is found, yes, in the high times and the exciting moments, and those are real, and God gives those. And we talked earlier about how those who are faithful in the small things will, in a good number of cases, be drawn into bigger things, bigger works. So that's a biblical teaching, too, that we don't want to miss. But we, we must know that God sees it all, and God sees the menial jobs, and God sees the humble, difficult moments. Just a few minutes ago in the break, I was upstairs and looking at some of the featured titles in the library here. Looks like you have a really, really uh, uh, interesting and, and well-stacked library. Praise God for that. And one of the books that was highlighted in the display case was For the Glory. For the Glory, about the sprinter Eric Liddell, the, the one who is the subject of the famous film Chariots of Fire. Many of you have seen Chariots of Fire. If you haven't seen Chariots of Fire, watch it tonight be a great way to let your brain relax a little bit after five days of issues in biblical anthropology, and also think a little bit about vocation, because few people in Christian history have had a richer understanding of vocation than Eric Little. What did he say? What did he famously say? When I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, that brings together a lot of what we're talking about, right? When he sprinted, he felt God's pleasure. That is beautiful. That's what we want. We want people in our, in our local churches to feel God's pleasure in their work according to what God has called them to do as best we can ascertain that. What I find interesting about Eric Little, though, is that the most interesting part of his life was not actually winning Olympic gold. The most interesting part of his life, and a, a number of you will know this, if you don't get the book For the Glory, For the Glory... I think Austin Duncan lets you read this in one of the classes he teaches. Uh, also, Wendell Berry's Jaber Crow. Those are elite book assignments, by the way. 
Nonetheless, if you haven't read For the Glory by Duncan Hamilton, a Scottish journalist, I don't believe a Christian, you must. You simply must. And Hamilton goes into the part of life that Liddell lived that we know very little about, most of us, the part where he serves as a missionary in China. And what happens is World War II comes to roost in Liddell's environment, and he ends up in a Japanese prison camp. And in this prison camp, it's a, it's a tiny enclosure, there is a camp prostitute. And other men help her out in physical tasks that she needs to, to survive, but they always demand favors from her. There are members of the prison camp who reported this after the war to reporters who were inquiring about Eric Little's life. There was only one man in the prison camp, according to this woman herself, a Russian prostitute, who did not demand favors from her when he would help her. And guess who it was? It was Eric Little. It was this godly missionary. And think about his life, men. He had a plan. He did what every man needs to do. He got a plan for his life. He wasn't a log on a river bumping along with no idea where he was going to go. There are points in our lives where things are confusing and uncertain, absolutely. But godly men who are called to lead themselves, fundamentally, whether married or single, and in many cases lead a wife and lead children, have to get a plan. You have to form a plan for your life. The Lord will rework that plan however he sees fit. But you have to have a plan. You're not a log bumping along in a river. Well, Eric Little had a plan. He was a missionary in China. He brought his family there, his wife and his three little girls, including a little girl who never met him because she was in her mother's womb when Eric Little sent the family to Canada as the war intensified. She, she was fathered by Eric Little in the covenant of marriage, but she never knew him. Eric Little had a plan, but what happened? His plan changed. No longer a missionary in the, in the province teaching. He was teaching as a missionary in China. No longer discharging the work he, he was sent there to do. Instead, imprisoned, enclosed, not able to freely share the faith as he desired. So what did he do? What did he do when God shook up his plans and changed his entire life and led to him being imprisoned? He was a Christian witness. He kept working. He worked unto the Lord. He was a witness until the day he died of disease. And he left a lasting testimony of holiness and godliness. He pursued Christian vocation with gusto, first as a sprinter, which God made him good at. Olympic gold he won. But then he gave it all up. He gave up fame, riches, influence, and he went to China to be a missionary. But then his life changed again, and he was imprisoned in a war camp. And even there, he was faithful to God. And he left a legacy, not because he single-handedly evangelized the whole camp and everybody came to faith, but in this one instance I just gave you, in this tiny little anecdote, tiny little anecdote, he was a godly man among ungodly men, and he stood out. And here I am, almost 80 years later, telling you this story. And I'm sure others will tell the story as well. When you work Coram Deo, when you live Coram Deo, you may not know the effect you are having. You may not get to see it even in your lifetime. But again, rest assured, God will be glorified. God will use you. God will bring about effects you don't even know. Think about churches. Think about churches that are pastored well, 
not by a pastor who's hopping around the ministry lily pads in desperate pursuit of a bigger church. There's a calling sometimes to leave a church and go to a bigger church. I'm not talking about, though, the American pastoral circuit. I'm talking about a guy who says, okay, I could be called somewhere. That can be righteous. But I'm, I'm going to really focus on this congregation. You, you pastor it for 30, 40, 50 years. What happens? You leave it, don't you? You leave it. You have no idea what's going to come of it. You can't you guarantee the church's health and vibrancy and Christian confession in years to come. Can you? Even if you labor as hard as you can. And yet, God will use your labors beyond what you ask, think, or know. Think of Spurgeon for just a minute. We have Spurgeon's library at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City, his books. We have a lot of his effects. We have the cigar that was on his chest when they found his dead body. Okay, we have our icons, okay, is what I'm trying to tell you. Spurgeon died in dissolution. Everybody now, oh, Spurgeon, let's quote Spurgeon. Let's put him on our social media. Wow, so many books, so many sermons. Spurgeon did not die in the high times. He died in low times when his friends were, were bleeding him. They were disappointing him. They were leaving him because of his stand for sound doctrine. You have no idea how God is going to use you. Spurgeon had no ability to manage his legacy going forward, but he understood. I was talking a bit with Phil Johnson this week, and he said this to me, and he's right. Spurgeon understood that he would be vindicated later on, that he stood for the truth in his day, and that God would vindicate his stand in years to come. And Spurgeon was right. And if you and I work unto the Lord now, while it is day, while there is time, God will use us. And if you take a stand for sound doctrine in your work, I'm talking to ministers here, this isn't a, a university setting after all, if you take a stand for the truth of God in our time, in your generation, God will vindicate your stand. You need a proper eschatology, not just referring to the length of the millennium or the precise nature of the millennium. You need that. You have to sort that out. But you also need simply to remember eschatology in the sense that God will vindicate his people. He will do it. He is not leaving his church without help. He is not going to leave the martyrs torn apart by wicked men, dissolute, their bodies broken. He is going to do what? To put it all back together. He is going to take those who have been slain, burned at the stake, crucified for the faith, imprisoned, separated from their families, their reputations in tatters, and He is going to exalt them on the last day. And that is a part of your doctrine of vocation as well. That is that reward element that we were discussing. Don't give much attention at all to your image, brand, or reputation while there is day. Give attention to doing your job. Give attention to being a craftsman in the world that God has made. Give attention to what glorifies God and let God sort out the rest. He is very, very good at sorting it out. You and I are not good at sorting out our image, brand, and reputation. In fact, when we tend to do that, we tend to mess it up. But God is very, very good at it. Martin Luther and John Calvin did not know where their movement would go following their deaths. Charles Spurgeon did not know where British Baptist life would go after his death. Neither do we. But friends, we are always in God's hands. All this is up to the sovereign, providential will of Almighty God. God, then, is the point of our work. God is the point of our vocation. He is the telos, or the end, of our vocation. Abraham Kuyper said it well in his lecture entitled, Calvinism and Religion. Wherever man may stand, Whatever he may do, 
to whatever he may apply his hand in agriculture and commerce and in industry or his mind in the world of art and science. He is, in whatsoever it may be, constantly standing before the face of his God. He is employed in the service of his God. He has strictly to obey his God. And above all, he has to aim at the glory of his God. That is true for for we who are in ministry, for you and for me, and that is true for the people we disciple and shepherd in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to double-click on a subset topic, wealth. Christians do not always have a, a good theology of wealth. We can sometimes think that it is better to be poor, or that the poor are righteous and the wealthy are not. Our society and culture, with its viewpoint that difference means inequity, and inequity means injustice, as I said a few days ago, fosters such an attitude in our hearts, if we are not careful, that the wealthy are necessarily evil in a special degree. Well, the wealthy can be, but they also may well not be. We need to not make the mistake of sanctifying poverty because the Bible does not sanctify poverty and the Bible does not sanctify the poor as if they are a righteous class. That is one of the most common ways to start subverting biblical Christianity and lose your Christian confession. To start thinking things like, The gospel is a gospel of social uplift. This is not a new problem. It's an old problem. And if you follow it, in many cases, historically, you end up thinking what I just said, that the wealthy are evil in a special degree, and the poor are effectively righteous, better than wealthy people. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Here... As I mentioned prior in the class, the Bible does not say the rich are evil and the rich should give away all their money. We should level society. We should try to guarantee equality of outcome. No, we understand according to the Bible that God gives some tremendous wealth, some medium level wealth, and calls some to a position essentially of poverty. So the Apostle Paul's instruction is not for the rich to feel bad about themselves or see themselves as guilty. The call on the wealth is to set, on the wealthy that is, excuse me, is to set their hope not on their wealth, but on God, which indicates by implication that there is going to be a tendency in the human heart to trust in wealth. And that is not only a a shortcoming of the wealthy, that is actually a mindset that the poor can fall into as well, isn't it? Some of us have experienced this. Some of us have known a lack of material prosperity, poverty. And, we, and some of you know how hard it is and how tempting it is in a given situation to think that if you could just have wealth, You would have what you need and you would be happy. But the Apostle Paul says, don't set your hope on the uncertainty of wealth. No one should, including the wealthy who have it. Even if you have it, it's uncertain. Isn't that striking in studying this passage exegetically? There is no certain wealth for anyone said more simply. The only certainty there is, is God. God is the great certainty of our life. 
the New Testament you see in Luke's gospel at the very beginning, chapter 1, was written so that we might have certainty, Luke says. The Scripture is a certainty-giving faith. It is not a reasonable approximation-giving faith. You certainly are not justified by your doubts. The Bible, in a sense, is about certainty, isn't it? Wealth, in this passage, is uncertain. It's sinking sand, even for the rich. Think about Job, who had fabulous wealth and possessions, and all of them were taken away as an opportunity to display God's glory, read in New Testamental terms, that is. God allowed Satan to do what Satan wanted to do to Peter, to sift Job like wheat, to turn Job's life inside out, to to upend Job's existence from the very top of the food chain to the bottom. To having, from having everything to having nothing. What is God teaching us? Well, many things in the case of Job, but one of them is the uncertainty of wealth. There is no such thing as certain possession of wealth. Instead, the rich should hope in God and do what is good and be rich in good works, to be generous. Ah, well, this is a key part of an understanding of vocation and work and wealth more broadly in terms of a theology of all the preceding. Generosity is a key part of biblical stewardship, isn't it? Getting things from God for the, for the natural man means storing them up. Getting things from God for the believer means being quick to generosity. Glad generosity. One of the saddest heart attitudes you can encounter in this world is stinginess. Stinginess. You need to be wise with your finances. That's a biblical uh, principle as well. Absolutely it is. But I'm always sad when I, when I meet a husband who sees himself rightly in biblical terms as the head of his wife, but then is stingy. Now, different families have different economic uh, ability and capacity. Absolutely. But we we pray, I think, as husbands that we would be generous husbands, reflecting the the character of of Christ, who is such a gracious husband to his bride. Paul doesn't condemn rich Christians for having wealth. He calls rich Christians to give generously, graciously, and happily. And that is actually where you find freedom from the love of money in a substantial form. When you can give money away, whatever your income level, whether you are wealthy or not, when you can part with your money, you are showing that your money is not your security and is not your certainty. Instead of storing up earthly treasure We store up heavenly treasure through good works done out of the overflow of divine grace. 1 Timothy 6, 18 to 19, this passage that we are discussing. The Bible, therefore, teaches neither poverty theology nor prosperity theology. Poverty theology makes the poor righteous a major soteriological problem. And prosperity theology teaches us that if we follow God, if we are a meaningful Christian, we will get what we want. I don't think I need to lay out a lengthy critique of that savaging of biblical truth, that if we just pray enough and follow God enough, we will get whatever we want. I think you know that that is a consumeristic rendering of the Christian faith. And I think you know further that the way of Christ, the way of the cross, shows you, in fact, that if you are faithful to God, there isn't a certain outcome necessarily in terms of your your finances, but you may well be called to give up everything 
including even your very life itself. In other words, being more faithful to God may mean that you part more with your earthly possessions. Jesus went to the cross, and Jesus followed the Father, submitted to the Father perfectly. We are freed in Christ to work, and we are freed in Christ to rest. Even as we have considered a proper theology in biblical terms of work and vocation, we need to think now about a proper doctrine, briefly, of rest. We actually talk a good deal more, I think, in the evangelical church about work than we do rest. Rest can even be seen as a negative reality. We shouldn't rest. Rest is wasting time. Rest is squandering opportunities. Rest isn't valuable. Rest doesn't glorify God. Work does. We need a properly balanced conception of work and rest, don't we? Together, they hang together. What does God do in creation? Six days of, of work, and the seventh day, He rests. A day that is not, of course, in the narrative of Genesis, bounded by 24 hours as the first six days are. Well, that means that God Himself gives great attention and energy to the work of creation, going back to that text. But it also means that there is a place, a carefully understood place, for rest. The divine rests from his works that he made following the six days of creation. The Lord did not need physical rest, as you will know. He was not tired from his creative labors. What rest signals theologically is security and satisfaction on God's part. He has accomplished his work. He's carried out his holy will. And this occasions celebration on the part of God. He made the seventh day holy. He set it apart as a picture of work done well of what happens when the will of God comes to full fruition. Here's what Ken Matthews says about this seventh day. By the commemoration of Sabbath, God and His creatures share in the celebration of the good creation, and God's people are enjoined to enter into the rhythm of work and joyful rest. Embracing God's Sabbath rest means experiencing the sense of completeness and well-being God had accomplished at creation on behalf of all human life. Another commentator says this about divine rest. This rest is not the rest of one who is exhausted. Creation rest describes the rest of one who is satisfied, one who looks at the world saying, Behold, it is very good. Never ceasing, never being satisfied, never finding time for any creature does not characterize a loving God. That's what Eugene Roop writes in his commentary on this passage. I think these two commentary uh, sections that I just read to you help us. They help us understand what God is doing at a divine level and resting. Again, he's not tired, he is satisfied. So in in bringing this down to our level, what do we do when we rest? Why did God call His people to the Sabbath day in Exodus 20? This is what Exodus 28 through 10 says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. The Israelites are called here in the Ten Commandments to enjoy freedom from their work. But theirs was a God-centered freedom, wasn't it? 
their time off was not dedicated to laziness and selfish indulgence. Their rest is a set-apart time of worship of the living God. Pharaoh, in technical terms, offered no rest. Remember this? When Israel is in captivity to Pharaoh in Egypt, there's no rest, and Pharaoh actually doubles the expectations of Israelite production. Pharaoh contrasts early in the Bible sharply with God. God is not Pharaoh. God is not the one who says, never rest. You get no rest. God is the one who mandates that his people rest in order that they would keep the Sabbath day holy. All of this means then that the Lord from the beginning, pre-fall, wanted his people to set aside time to not work, to not labor. The Lord did not want his people to be the same as those in a post-fall world who would work without ceasing or who would only rest. We work for God as believers, and then we rest for God. We work for God, and we rest for God. Because of this, as part of our rest, we can sleep. (laughs) It's funny because you can think of sleep as a non-theological reality or non-biblical reality, but that's actually not true, is it? What does Psalm 8 say? I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. Some of us have experienced that resting through sleep can be a real challenge, actually. And if you struggle with sleeplessness, whew, this can be a very difficult problem to address and overcome. In fact, we may not overcome it in this life. But we do note in biblical terms that God wants His people to sleep, not simply because that's a good bodily recharging habit, but but the bodily rest flows out of theological rest in God. That's what the psalmist is saying. I live in safety beneath you, Lord, and so I can rest. I can sleep in peace. If we struggle with this, if we struggle with sleep, or if loved ones in our family struggle with sleep, some of you may may have this situation, may face the situation in some form, then we want to pray for those who have trouble resting, and we want to do all we can in common grace wisdom terms to try to work toward better sleep, and we want to ground all of that pursuit in the kindness of God for His children salvifically ongoingly for the church. God guards us at night. God gives us peace that overcomes the flesh. God quiets stormy hearts. All this is part of what the Lord does. It is not going to be the case that if you simply trust God and follow the Lord, you will automatically sleep amazingly. But it is the case that we would desire this rest, and we do well to prioritize it and to pray for it, even as it can prove elusive in life. Part of, by the way, how we fight sleeplessness is we fight anxiety, and part of how we fight anxiety is we confess it to God and repent of it on a regular basis. We're all indicted here. This isn't just some miserable Christian out there who who sometimes gets anxious. Honestly, we are frail and fragile creatures, and we are all prone to anxiety in different forms. Sometimes husbands can get frustrated with their wives when their wives feel anxious, but husbands themselves, though they may not feel as anxious as their wives, we, we ourselves will have our things that cause us anxiety and fear and worry in a sinful sense. I believe in biblical counseling. I believe that we need to apply the Word of God 
and the gospel of God to all of our lives. Anxiety is not just a psychological challenge. Anxiety is first and foremost sin. It's failure to lay hold of the wisdom of God. It's failure to trust God, isn't it? That doesn't mean that we should then feel desperately unredeemable as Christians. It means that we all have a lot to repent of. And it means that if this manifests in sleeplessness, we want to do all we can to confess anxiety and to build in rhythms of trust of God into our lives, feeding on the Word of God, turning our anxiety to God, casting our cares, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, upon the Lord, for He cares for us. Give your anxieties to God. Repent of your anxiety and then pray to God for what you are troubled by, what you are anxious over. That's really the program the Scripture gives us uh, to overcome anxiety. Nonetheless, like anything, we recognize we're in a long-term progressive struggle for sanctification, and so we approach this in those terms, praying for bodily rest that flows out of spiritual rest purchased for us by Christ. The Lord leads us beside still waters, doesn't He? We walk through the valley of the shadow of death with foes all around us, Psalm 23. We are in the presence of our enemies, as in the psalm. The psalm that that we so frequently cite, Psalm 23, is not talking uh, uh, about an easy peace. The peace that passes all understanding in the New Testament is not an easy peace, is it? It's a peace in warfare. It's a peace with trials and troubles and burdens all around you that you have to continually give to God. And this leads us firmly to Christ. What does Christ say? You say, rest, man. You're talking about rest in an elective at TMS? We're supposed to talk about theology. Ah, really? Rest isn't theological. Interesting. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What is rest ultimately in biblical terms? Christological, isn't it? Christocentric. What does Jesus say that he will give his people? He knows they and we are weary. You feel weary? Do you feel tired at different times? Jesus knows you are. Are you burdened? Are are you and your family dealing with much these days? If you're married, are you and your spouse working through a lot? Are we not in 2021 facing trials seemingly at every turn? Do we not feel like normal life has crossed over into abnormal life? That it is now normal to have chaos and not normal to have peace? Does this not feel, does this not resonate in this time? It feels like the world is turned upside down. We're burdened. Many of us are burdened. Admit it. Jesus knows we're burdened, doesn't he? All of you who are weary and burdened, bearing heavy loads, what does Jesus say? I will give you rest. To know Jesus then, soteriologically, is to rest. It is to rest in Christ. It is to know the peace of of God. What does this mean theologically, though, bearing in, pressing into this reality? Well, if we correlate texts, and there's disagreement about Sabbath fulfillment among inerrantist Christians, okay? So I, I don't want to go into this in a, in a major way. 
and stake out a hard and fast position that I would argue only, only people can hold. But I, I, I will say this, Hebrews 4.10 connects rest to resting from our own works. So the rest that Jesus is offering us, again, is soteriological rest. Jesus knows that we are a striving people who, who try in our natural state at some level to justify ourselves. I think that's the context of Matthew 11. The weariness and the burden that Jesus engages in Matthew 11, 28 is not simply feeling tired. It is that. But ultimately, the problem that the gospel of Jesus Christ is solving is the problem of our inability to find rest through our own works. None of us can. Works cannot justify us. Our flesh cannot save us. Only Jesus gives us rest. Only Jesus gives us peace. And when you have Jesus, as I read Scripture theologically, you don't have 13% rest or 37% rest or 62% rest. You have fullness of salvific rest. You have rested from your works entirely. You have given your salvation over to Jesus. You have recognized that you are a hopeless case. <laughs> you are confessing that you are a failure salvifically. My, my efforts to save myself have not gone well. They have gone terribly and tragically. I have not succeeded in saving myself. I cannot justify myself. I cannot live in a state of peace. I do not have peace with God in myself, and I don't have peace with men horizontally as a result. So what Jesus offers, Matthew 11, correlated with Hebrews 4, other texts we could bring in, is perfect, salvific rest. We rest from our labors. We rest from our own works. We no longer try to justify ourselves. And as Christians, this doesn't go away at the moment of conversion, does it? You will slip into works-driven Christianity repeatedly in your Christian life. I'm not saying that your, your behavior doesn't matter. I think you know already from the rest of the class that that's not where I am in, in these broader discussions. I believe that the gospel saves us to get to work. That the imperatives are not only high standards we can't meet, but are actual callings, the New Testament imperatives grounded in the gospel of grace. Nonetheless, we will try as Christians, we will slip into a mindset that grounds our faith not in God and His goodness, in, in His salvation that He has brought us into, but in our own performance. We will try at different points to drive the church ahead in our own strength. It's not that we don't work hard in ministry. We should work hard. We should be tired in ministry. We should go hard and go hard and go hard and then die and enter into fullness of rest. Nonetheless, that is not the same thing as trying to grow the church in your own strength. That we must not do. We must not fall in our lives into a performance-driven faith that militates against the very reality of justification by faith and by faith alone. We are not justified because of our performance. We are justified because of God-given faith. And we have to remember that. You know that. You're probably listening to me say that and, and thinking, yeah, I, I get it, sure. But you, <laughs> really, it's the simple truths that you have to remember over and over again, isn't it? It's not so much the super complex realities that no one talks about that you have to remember as a Christian. It's the simple truths that you have to go back to time and time again. 
Don't justify yourself by your performance. Work very hard out of the overflow of divine love given you in Christ by faith in His name. But never think that you are justified or you are kept in the kingdom by your performance. Jesus is our rest. I believe, I'll, I'll put just a little on record here. I believe that the Sabbath is now. I believe that Jesus is our Sabbath. I believe that we are no longer bound, therefore, by the old covenant command to take the Lord's day in New Testamental terms, following the resurrection, off from work. I, I don't believe it's ideal for most Christians to work on Sunday, therefore, but I don't believe that working on Sunday is breaking the Sabbath. And there I would break with my Reformed Baptist friends who would understand that the Sabbath continues in the current day. I believe that Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 are so explosive, correlated with Hebrews 4, that the Sabbath has come to fulfillment in Christ. Jesus, therefore, is our rest. It, it's not that the point of Jesus' coming was to preserve the Sabbath. It's that the point of the Sabbath was to point ahead to Jesus Christ. So we have perfect fulfillment in Christ of the Sabbath, which means that we live in the Sabbath. You understand? We have a spiritual Sabbath, not a chronological Sabbath anymore. A Sabbath is to know Jesus. To know Jesus is to be freed from enslavement to sin and to our works. We are free. We have rest now. We have rest from our works. No one can bind us back to enslavement. In Jesus, the Sabbath has come to fruition and completion. It's clear that Christians disagree over that reality, have different positions on it, and I, I want to extend charity and, and grace to those who would disagree with me, including people I would have tremendous agreement with on many doctrinal points. But my own view is that I have Sabbath rest now. Now, in saying that, I don't mean that I have final rest now. So let me give you a distinction. Theology is so much about distinctions, isn't it? Fine distinctions in a lot of cases. I believe that we have full rest now, but we will have final rest in the age to come. We have full rest now in Jesus, fullness of salvation. I don't believe we're mostly saved or partially saved. I believe that I am fully saved now. I'm saved. But that doesn't mean that I have come to my final state of rest. I have not. And that's how I understand Hebrews 4 speaking of there is, there is this rest that will come to completion. I have full rest, but I don't have my final state of rest, just as correlates perfectly with other soteriology from the Scripture. I have full salvation. I have full justification. I have full adoption, but I don't have final forms of all that I just noted. That is all to come. But that's different than partial and full or partial and final, isn't it? Full and final is a different technical distinction than partial and final. And I think that distinction matters greatly. And I think it matters greatly for our preaching and teaching. I think we offer people full, salvific rest in Jesus. Isn't it interesting, by the way, just at a practical level to think about many unbelievers? Many unbelievers simply, at a basic level, tragically, don't live in rest. You hear stories of famous celebrities, for example, cultural influencers, let's say, 
And, and weirdly, they'll stay up through the, and through the night. I'm sure you've read profiles about this. I think of a figure like Sinatra, read a biography of Frank Sinatra some years ago. Amazing voice, amazing voice. And yet a man who could not sleep. And you, you think there that there has to be, for many unbelievers, sadly, such a manifestation of their guilt and their shame that, that they cannot rest as the Scripture tells us we can in Christ. When you live for the flesh, in many cases, you will not be able to rest even at the physical level. And so we pray that we who know Christ salvifically will be able to rest more and more. For we are free from that tragic, terrible condition. What does all this lead to? Well, all this leads naturally, fluidly, to a theology of not just rest, but play or entertainment. Call it different things. Here again, that may sound unserious, unworthy of extended theological consideration. But think about this. Right now, one of the major challenges disciples face is an entertainment-saturated culture. We have essentially built for ourselves a new capacity and need of humanity in our time. This is new. The need to be entertained. The need to be entertained at all times. Think about what is available to us on digital platforms that I'm guessing many of you engage in that I do. Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, on and on it goes. They continue popping up, don't they? What, can, what does that create? What expectation does that yield in many of us? Again, that we not only have a capacity to be entertained, that's not new, but we have a need to be entertained. We need it on a daily basis, just like we, we need physical exercise or we need food, we need rest. For most people in most of human history, entertainment was a luxury and a rarity. Entertainment would be uh, confined to feast days or festival days in many agricultural settings, for example. You didn't, you didn't have entertainment to queue up at any time you wanted. You didn't have a TV. You didn't have this technology. Here, here we're back to where we were talking about in previous sessions. These things, these things hang together, don't they? Many of these realities that we're addressing. Right now, you can queue up hundreds of thousands of hours of entertainment. You can and I can. Movies. TV shows, songs, books, whatever media you want, for a minimal fee, 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, you can watch media whenever you want, wherever you want. Entertainment in such a society and culture can feel like a duty, can't it? Again, like a need. When in reality, it is no such thing. If we're not careful, this is why it's so important to know the times and know the word. Because knowing the times will help you understand and appreciate the word all the more. I don't mean that you have to know the times. I do mean that it will help. I, I firmly believe that. If you understand just how entertainment saturated our culture is, you will then be freed to understand how that culture is influencing you and affecting you and your loved ones probably without even knowing it and shaping even such things as ministry, preaching, the church itself. Don't you think that many churches have adapted entertainment culture? Do you see this? Do you not understand that one of the quickest ways to gather a crowd is to build a very 
entertaining church, to have a church that has major sizzle factor, to have a church that has amazing musical worship, and that has entertaining presentations from the pulpit. There's not even a pulpit anymore. There might be a little wobbly table at best. I'm all for the building of a sturdy, solid, glorious, craftsman-made pulpit. That's what I personally prefer. I don't have chapter and verse on that. Okay, so slow your roll, but nonetheless, that's what I prefer. You know, you go somewhere to preach, even a, even a strong church, and there's a little wobbly table, and it doesn't even tilt up like this desk does. Thankfully, it tilts. It's just a table. I can't read my notes. Or there's a music stand. Worst of all, oh, I tremble when I see a music stand because I typically, you know, bring my uh, Bible with me into the pulpit, and I know... You, you know what I'm talking about, some of you. I know, depending on where I put the Bible, it's going to wait. The, I've, I've had to hold the music stand for the entirety of my sermon before. We need a book of, of uh, preacher experiences, don't we? I've gotten through a few of them. I've talked about the offices comparison thing. We have a dispensation of grace to compare offices, I've humorously said. Another one is music stand preaching. That's going to be another chapter in my book holding a stand while you preach. Is there anything more terrifying than that? You can't, the Bible, you get the Bible in your notes if you have notes or your iPad. You barely have enough room. The whole thing's going to capsize. You're going you're gonna to end up on YouTube for the next 25 years. Your grandchildren are going to laugh at you for your foibles. The church can set itself up as an entertainment-driven entity, just with a spiritual twist. What a danger. What a danger. It's often those soft, soft corruptions of the faith that I would argue actually pose the greatest threat to the faith. It's a church that still says it's preaching the word and the gospel, but subtly shifts the ministry of the church and the preaching of the church to be about entertainment. What does that create? Because the preaching of the church always shapes disciples. You're always making disciples, aren't you? Some cases you make true disciples, some cases you make fake disciples. An entertainment-saturated church creates entertainment-craving disciples. Creates people who need to be, what? Stimulated who need a steady diet of excitement. What's the exciting new plan, pastor? What's the enthralling vision of the church? What are you going to do next to captivate us? That's what you get in an entertainment-driven church. Whereas when, when you have a church that just offers people the word and the gospel, one thing you do is you free yourself from having to be a circus conductor and have a continual round of new entertainment. All you have to offer people is the word and the gospel, the ministry of the faith, the love of the body. What a thought. The Bible doesn't necessarily give us an extended theology of entertainment in my conception. Nonetheless, we do know that there is a biblical category of celebration, certainly, in the Old Testament. Think of the 50th year of the Israelite community, the year of Jubilee, a time of festival, also called in the Scripture the year of liberty. It's an entire year after, after 49 years in which the community took the year off, forgave the debts of their debtors, and spent time with their loved ones. Leviticus 25, 8 through 12. This is what God called His people to observe. It's a holy year, a year of liberty, the 50th year. That tells us something again. It's like the six days and resting on the seventh day. 49 years of work before the 50th year. 
What's the calibration there? What's the setting? A whole lot of work, yes? A whole lot of labor. A whole lot of tiredness. But then, but then, jubilee, festival, celebration, rest, leisure, feasting. We need to make sure that our Christian faith, whole Bible Christianity, has this element in it, this element of delight, of feasting, of joy, of unbridled satisfaction in God. If your faith doesn't have that component, you're missing something strongly biblical. Think of how the rest of the Old Testament engages celebration. Isaiah 25, 6, the Lord of armies in coming days will prepare for the for all the peoples, a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat. Cho- choice meat is a very big deal, clearly, here. Fine vintage wine. This is, this is kind of finer things of life feasting, isn't it? From who? The Lord of armies. In contrast to the starving Gentiles, that's Isaiah 25, 6, of Isaiah 21, 13 to 17, the Gentiles don't have this feast. The Lord invites His people to a banquet table overflowing with goodness. And not, in this passage, Isaiah 25, 6, spiritualized goodness. However you interpret this passage and apply it, it's presented to us as a feast. Meat, the best cut, the $100 steak, or in Kansas City terms, the burnt ends of the brisket, a feast with aged wine, not one-year or two-year-old wine, 50-year wine, wine of the best vintage, wine of the coolest cellar. You see, I'm getting edgy here. I'm reading the Bible. Interpret it as you see fit, according to the New Testament. This is what Isaiah 25 tells us. This is aged. In other words, this is the best stuff there is. This is all pointing us to a greater celebration of God. God routing His foes. God defeating His enemies. God, what? Celebrating with His people. The point we should take away is that God loves celebration. There is an appropriate element of celebration and feasting and festival and joy in the community throughout the Bible. What happens, moving ahead to the New Testament, what happens when the prodigal son returns in Luke 15, 21 to 25? What takes place? The father looks at the prodigal son and says, You idiot! You finally came home. You're ungrateful. You did what you you were supposed to do. Get in the house. I don't even want to see you. Is that what takes place in this famous parable? Not at all, is it? Luke 15, 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves. Think about the character of Almighty God that's being identified here. Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And then what language is used here? And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field As he came near the house, he heard music 
and dancing. There's much to say about this passage, of course, many ways to read it and apply it. But for our purposes, note the character of the Father in the parable Jesus tells. He is not a stingy, mean Father. He is a Father who lavishly celebrates the return of His prodigal, of His wayward child. He gives this son the best robe. Bring it out. Do it quickly. Put a ring on his finger, valuable ring. Put fine sandals on his feet. Bring delicious food, the fattened calf, out. And let's have a feast. And let's celebrate. This one was dead. He was gone, and he is alive again. What are we learning here? We're learning that this little portrait of fatherly joy is correlated with a time of celebration. We're learning something, I think, about the character of God himself. We're learning that there is a time for celebration. We're learning that all this is to be anchored in the kindness and grace and greatness of God. Our faith is not a miserly faith. The faith of the pagans has no ultimate feasting and celebration in it. It may look like that. They may look like they're hedonists, Epicureans, but they're actually not. We are those who truly celebrate. We are those who know true joy. In the doctrine of salvation and in the doctrine of salvation alone is grounds for true celebration and true feasting and true delight. And that is where you are. That is where you are now. You have come home to the Father by His kindness. The Father has killed the fattened calf for you and welcomed you into his home, adopting you into his home, giving you the keys to his entire palace. This is the character of Almighty God. This is the God we proclaim to lost people every chance we get. This is just how great the love of God is. That all who repent confess their sin, and place their faith and trust in Jesus, the doors are open wide for them, and they may come in. Well, if we're paying attention, then that means that we're learning something about the character of God, the nature of celebration, the nature of leisure more broadly. There is a place for it. There is a place for it. By application, way of application, your your home should be a serious place. Whatever your status is, maritally, it should be a serious place. It should be a place of zealous pursuit of Almighty God. Absolutely. That is what your life should be characterized by. But you should also be one who people look at and see joy in, happiness in, celebration in. You are not following a miserly Christian God. You are following a gracious, loving, celebrating Christian God who gives you true joy and true delight. When it comes to these matters then, we should do theological application. Listen, we're busy. We can all get tired. We can all slip into, as men in ministry, a kind of grim Christianity where there is not joy that pulses forth from us. When we see ourselves getting low, when we are short and clipped with our loved ones, when we are not gracious, when we are not forgiving, we need to repent, confessing that to God, 
and we need to claim freshly these resources that we're laying out here and recognize that we must always do all we can to give evidence of this surging current of joy and aesthetic delight and gladness that is ours in Christ Jesus. And I am talking about those who are inerrantists. I am talking about those who love biblical authority. I am talking about those who love biblical sufficiency. Joy should not only be for those who are fruity Christians. (laughs) There's an interesting term. Joy should be for those of us who are rock-ribbed, sound doctrine-loving Christians. People should look at us and they should see seriousness, holy seriousness. We should stand out along those lines. What is with that guy? Why is his face set like a flint? What is his deal? Why is he always talking about God? Why does he read his Bible? Our next door neighbors. Why is their family, why is their family getting up early and going to church? week after week. Why are they the way they are? To quote Michael Scott, why, do, why are you the things you choose to be? Okay, sorry, that was a lighter moment. We had to bring him in at the end, didn't we? We hadn't got him in earlier. And then with our fatherhood and motherhood and our marriages, why is that marriage, why is it happy? Why are they affectionate to one another? Why is he tender to his wife? Why does she follow him? Why why does he run around his backyard after a long day? Why does he play football with his son? Why is he sitting in the backyard or on his balcony of his apartment having a tea party with a little girl? Why? Why are they this way? Why are they such a strange blend of holy seriousness but also deep joyfulness. That's where all of this comes together. Men, there is a surging undercurrent of joy running through the Bible. And it is truly an element that John Piper in our time has understood and rightly promoted. And we need to make sure that that is showing up in our Christian witness and Christian life. Well, we need to conclude, and I'll take just a few minutes of questions. We're going to get out a few minutes early today. We're going to end in just a few. In all of this, here's the summary word, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. We are to do all things to the glory of God. Men, this means that we are to work very hard to the glory of God. And in ministry, we are to set the tone in our churches of that rhythm of hard work. We don't want the hardworking providers in our congregation. We, we don't have the same hours they have necessarily. Don't misunderstand. But we don't want them to look at us and think, that guy does not even really do a hard day's work. We want them to look at us and think, he works hard for the glory of God. He sets the tone. He's the captain of this team. I want to follow that guy. Expect that men, real men, will follow a pastor who sets that tone. And that men will look askance at a man who doesn't work hard, as they should. We want to work very hard in ministry, but we also want to rest we recognize that our rest is first and foremost theological, soteriological, Christocentric, yes? But it's not only that. It does take shape in bodily form. We are men who are able to set our work down, to step away from the office, as I said a few days ago, to turn the phone off when we come in the doors. And we are able we are able to enjoy life and celebrate God's goodness to God's glory as well. We work for God's glory. We rest for God's glory. 
and we play, understood rightly, or celebrate, choose your term, for God's glory. And that is a properly balanced, I believe, Christian existence. And that itself is a, is a very meaningful part of what it means to be human, what it means to be remade in the image of Christ, what it means to be saved and bought back from the dead by God. That's a major part of how we're going to be a witness in these evil days and these uncertain times, is very simply to embrace the re-enchantment of our humanity, which is to say simply, salvation in the name of Christ, through which we become, we who are fully human in Adam's image, become truly human from one degree of glory to another in the image of Christ. Okay, uh, any questions as we wrap up our time together here on anything I've covered today? If you all sit on your hands, even your virtual hand, you get out even earlier. But you will be robbed, you will be robbed of the further enlightenment that is to flow. That was a sarcastic comment. Justin. Do you have any um, uh, resources that you would recommend if we say we wanted to uh, teach our congregation like a, like a small um, you know, like Bible study or something through a theology of vocation? I mean, obviously we could use your book, but is there anything that's really a lot deeper in like different areas that would be really uh, relevant to you know, uh, various people working in different vocations? Yeah, good question. Um, Leland Riken's book, Worldly Saints, is very good on the Puritan doctrine of vocation. Worldly Saints, I'd commend that to you. And he shows that the stereotypes about the Puritans as killjoys, for example, doesn't hold water in a lot of cases. Uh, so that's one resource. Gene Veith, V-E-I-T-H, has uh, some good writings on vocation, on living quorum Deo, God at work, your Christian vocation in all of life. He draws especially off of Luther, God at work. Uh, that's, a helpful, that's a helpful book. I like uh, Wayne Grudem's uh, Business for the Glory of God. That would be a really nice resource to give uh, laymen in your church because it's understandable. Uh, but, but theologically sound and theologically rich. I was thinking of another Veith book, sorry, uh, but I can't find it at present. But those are some. Uh, that would get you down the road in terms of uh, a, a sense of vocation uh, that would start you. One of the best things you could do is to, to read Luther on vocation. So Luther's works has different sections, and Veith can be a pointer to you there. But I really, I truly believe that Luther is one of the most important voices here. Uh, not because I follow Luther in, in all facets, I don't, but because Luther is pushing out of. <laughs> I mean, he's, <laughs> he's the first dude to do it, yeah? He's pushing out of Catholic categories and into biblical ones. And so he's the, found, he's the reason you guys are on this Zoom session. He's the reason in human terms you guys are at Master's. The reason there is a Protestant movement, the reason there is an evangelical tradition is in human terms because of Martin Luther. You can't underplay his significance. And, and what he does is he shows that the Catholic understanding of vocation where priestly work, this is called sacerdotalism, matters greatly, and then other work, mm, not really significant, is, is a travesty in biblical terms. In truth, all work done in faith matters to God. So Luther recovers that, uh, and that's a major break that he makes uh, with Catholic theology. Very thankful for that. Sproul would be good on these matters as well. 
Christian worldview. There's a lot to say. Okay, any other question? Last question at the bell, at the buzzer. Yes, Grace Church. Uh, I didn't do my homework last night, but I did watch The Darkest Hour. My man. All right, I, I saw your tweet. And then next, um, just on wokeness and critical race theory, when you mention it as a threat, and I don't think I've heard you speak to this, if I can just, there's an idea, and I'm wondering if you think this is where it's headed as far as the oppressors and the oppressed. Is part of the danger or the threat that this whole movement is moving toward declaring the church that is Christianity the ultimate oppressor? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's actually happening now. It's 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 building steam along those lines. If you associate whiteness with white supremacy, as we talked about a few days ago, what happens when you get a lot of white people in a church or a white movement is that you end up with what? A racist movement. Um, one way this is playing out now is, <laughs> wow, we're ending with a bang here in me saying this, but a lot of people who supported Trump at some level, whether enthusiastically or holding their nose in the recent election, are seen as Christian nationalists uh, who just want America to become this, uh, this, this white Christian nation again. And so that's read in racist terms as well. There's different angles this is, this is building from, um, but suffice it to say that I think we are going to see this argument only pick up more and more in days ahead, that the white evangelical church, insofar as it has aligned itself at some level with political conservatism, uh, insofar as it stands against wokeness, uh, is a racist movement is an oppressor, yes. And we're just going to have to continue contending for the faith, speaking the truth in love, making clear that we are not here because of racism and ethnocentrism. We, in fact, condemn it. Uh, and yet, we're probably going to take some heat. And that's, uh, that, that may well be part of how we grow increasingly marginalized as a church. If we ourselves are of white skin, or if we are uh, in unity in our church or in our movement with brothers and sisters who have white skin and are not woke. It is not going to get easier, brothers, along these lines and others, to be a conservative Christian in America. It is getting harder seemingly by the minute, and it will continue to get harder. Uh, we have to make sure that we are lashed to the mast. Uh, Christ, Christ is, is in the storm. Christ is in the boat. <laughs> Christ is the boat. <laughs> Lash yourself to the mast. Tie yourself to the mast like an ancient seaman. Uh, the seas are stormy now and will get stormier but we will make it safely across in Christ.